Jobs, uh, uh, Wellness Before Community Building and Connection at the U Ottawa Library. Um, so before we get started, the chat is going to be open so you can kind of, you know, interact with uh, um, you know, fellow participants or also the hosts or the panelists, I guess, and um, the q and A. If you have any questions, please use the q and A function. So um, I'm so excited to, I guess, listen more about from Cecilia Tellis, Fatu Bata, uh, Megan McKinnon, uh, who are all University of Ottawa librarians. And uh, I'll, I'll pass the mic on to them. Thanks so much, Olivia. So hello and welcome to Beyond Bath Bombs, Wellness Through Community Building and Connection at UOttawa Library. So during today's session, as was already mentioned, we invite you to use the chat and the reactions features in Zoom. We'll be asking questions throughout the presentation and we're excited to hear your responses and to engage in conversation with you all. So as a way of modeling a sense of care and connection, we'll be doing our introductions a little bit differently today. So we'll each introduce a member of the presentation team and then share one thing that is meaningful to us in our working relationships. So before I, I'm just gonna find my notes though. So I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Megan McMeekin, who was the very first person to take on the role of inclusion librarian at the University of Ottawa in 2019. So in this role, she engages with campus and community partners to ensure that the library is as inclusive and accessible as possible for all users. Prior to this, she worked for nearly eight years at the Ottawa Public Library in various roles involving creating and providing accessible and inclusive public library services. So what I find particularly meaningful to me in our working relationship is that in co-leading for our library's community of practice that touches on issues of equity, diversity, inclusion, we can tackle tough subjects together while also recognizing that we both still have a lot to learn. Hi everyone, so my name is Megan and I'm going to introduce Fatu today. So I would like to introduce my awesome colleague Fatu. Fatu is the Data Support Specialist at the University of Ottawa, Lead Accessibility Specialist at Open Collaboration for Cognitive Accessibility, as well as a student at the University of Ottawa School of Information Studies. She uses her lived experience as a neurodiverse woman to improve the accessibility and inclusivity of research methods. What I find meaningful about our working relationship is that Fatu is always up for working with me and with us on various accessibility projects, trainings, presentations, and she contributes her extensive knowledge with us. Even though Fatu is not part of our department, she very much feels like part of our team. Hi, I'm Fatu, and I would like to introduce you to my colleague Cecilia Tellis. Um, so Cecilia is the head of design and outreach at the U Ottawa Library. Um, and ensuring that services and spaces at the Ottawa Library are grounded in user-centered design principles is integral to Cecilia's work. In doing so, she coordinates efforts to communicate the impacts of the library on student, academic, and scholarly success, and identifies opportunities and develops solutions to ensure the library is inclusive and accessible. As a colleague, Cecilia is always extremely supportive and uses her incredible listening skills and compassion to give great advice. I'm always impressed by Cecilia's leadership at the library when it comes to issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Thanks, Fatu. It does be all teary-eyed every time. Um, so we are in the month of June. Lots of things happening in June, uh, most notably National Indigenous History Month. So we would like to also recognize that we're all joining each other from different places and that you too may be considering the history of colonization, genocide, systemic erasure, and continued oppression where you are located. So we would ask that in addition to acknowledging the history of the spaces you're occupying, that you also take action to put those words into practice, such as by finding and actively supporting the local indigenous organizations in your area. So I'd now like to take a moment to, re to read the University of Ottawa's land affirmation. We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous peoples in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. So in case you're wondering, pictured here is a sculpture by Mohawk and Oneida artist David General entitled She Dances with the Earth, Water and Sky, uh, which happens to be on the lawn of Tabere Hall. 
So what do we want to cover today? Um, we're going to cover our, inter our interpretation of what wellness and its connection to EDI is, how we have attempted to build connections ourselves within our internal library community, how we build connections with communities that we work with at the library, um, challenges that, we, that we've encountered in our work, just so that you, you know, don't go away thinking that we're, you know, working in some sort of nirvana uh, library. Um, some concluding thoughts, and we're going to leave, of course, some time for Q and A and for some discussion. So I'm going to begin by asking you, the attendees, a question. So to you, what is wellness? How would you define wellness and what role does the library play in supporting the wellness of its internal and external community? So if you could just pop your answer in the chat. Okay, Elena says that to her, it's about uh, physical and emotional health. Um, wellness is political, quality of life, yeah. Considering health holistically to incorporate mental and physical, emotional, et cetera, very, very true. Um, so if you look up the definition of wellness in the dictionary, you'll get something along the lines of, you know, a state of being in good health. Um, but according to the uh, WHO constitution, Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This means that wellness is about taking a holistic approach, um, like you said in the chat, um, and integrating physical wellness along with mental and social, as well as occupational wellness, um, like Ali said in the chat. Next slide, please. So um, here we can see uh, the wheel of wellness, which represents the seven dimensions of wellness. Um, so we have your intellectual, social, physical, spiritual, occupational, emotional, um, and environmental, environmental. And this wheel showcases that wellness is a continuous and lifelong process. So there is no optimal wellness level that one can reach as life is truly unpredictable. So any change, even minor, in any of these dimensions of wellness can either positively or negatively infect any of the other dimensions of wellness. So maintaining a balance between um, the demands in your personal life, as well as the resources available to meet those demands, is really crucial uh, to wellness. So we also often focus on the physical, the emotional, and maybe the spiritual aspects of wellness, as those are generally the ones that are mostly talked about. So you're told to eat healthy foods, exercise, take care of your mental health, meditate, go to the spa, and the list goes on. But we often forget the occupational dimension of wellness and that fulfillment of your work expectations and obligations just fall within uh, the definition of wellness. And finding meaning as well as satisfaction in your work or your studies is really important to wellness. And so it's finding balance between um, your occupational demands and all these other aspects of wellness. So in the past two years or so, I'm sure you've heard of EDI, equity, diversity, inclusion, IDEA, IDARE-wide, or any other variation of the acronym um, in the workplace. And maybe you're even on an EDI committee um, in more than one. And while it is a buzzy word, um, EDI is tightly interconnected with occupational wellness. And that's where we see now the acronym WIDE um, coming, coming into play. And EDI can also positively or negatively impact someone's wellness. So a workplace that truly fosters equity, diversity, and inclusion will be beneficial to an employee's well-being. Um, and this is even more important to empl for employees from underrepresented groups who are at times the most impacted by these issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, furthermore, an inclusive and equitable workplace can really increase occupational satisfaction and bring feelings of fulfillment um, and contribute positively to the mental and physical health of employees. So we wanted to pause again and ask you all um, this question. 
which is what gives you a sense of belonging in a space, whether that be virtual or physical. Um, we asked this question a few weeks ago to a group of library school students who were taking a course on sort of access and services for diverse populations. And I was just really curious about how maybe this definition for you has changed over obviously in the past two years. So we'd be really curious to hear some of your answers. Ali shares not having to hide aspects of myself. Yep, super important, yep. Anything else? Some shared values, yeah, for sure. Being heard, yeah, really important. Yeah, active listening. Anything that communicates empathy or humanizes the experience from Martha. Acknowledging we are people, absolutely. Stability, yes, thoughtful design, yes. I know, I've been thinking about design so much. Anything being physically accessible, yes. Awesome, I love it. Thank you. Tara adds, having physical spaces that correspond to the needs of my work, fantastic and so necessary. Yeah, my neck really hurts in the past like two days. Clearly I did not set up my desk properly. Uh, so many good answers. Control, having a sense of um, not having anyone looking over your shoulders. Yes, of course. Absolutely, being comfortable and safe with those I trust. Thank you. A welcoming environment, a sense of community. Wonderful answers. Thank you all for your sharing. Um, Definitely want to want to share these back. Um, ben is saying that he's got a cat in your leash. Okay, <laughs> okay, empathy and clarity communication. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Continue to pop these into the chat as we as we move, move along with our, our slides here. Um, so we're going to be moving on to connecting to our library community. Thanks, Cecilia. So. In our abstract, we pose the question, is it wise to promote options of individual wellness assistance programs, which many organizations did throughout the pandemic especially, without accounting for the principles that underscore equity, diversity, and inclusion, or EDI? Are these programs truly improving the wellness of employees? Is the strong emphasis on individual well-being detrimental to the idea of collective well-being? And how can we all, as library workers, contribute to a greater sense of wellness in our workplaces and beyond the pandemic? So as we learn to navigate through these challenges, we wanted to remain committed to our own well-being, along with our desire to foster a sense of belonging and community in the library, while staying true to the organization's vision of championing EDI, accessibility, and anti-racism initiatives, including outreach events, collection building, and human-centered services. Wellness, uh, physical and mental, and EDI are intrinsically linked. An organization cannot be successful by focusing on one without the other. Principles of EDI are linked to feelings of belonging. To feel fully included and respected within an organization has a direct impact on one's feeling of well-being. When our needs are being met, when we, for example, have a disability or health or health accommodations that are met, this improves our accessibility, but also our well-being. When an organization speaks about topics that are difficult, when they recognize the challenges or issues faced by certain communities, when they celebrate people, mark events to celebrate diverse communities, this sends a message. We'll each be sharing some examples in our work of connecting to our library community, which includes our internal staff library community, as well as the larger university community, which also includes students and staff at the University of Ottawa. <clears throat> so a post from January of this year from the Insta Instagram account of Corn Ann, who is a graphic designer who promotes design and illustration for good, shared a post with a graphic with the text, there's no self care without community care. I also included her Instagram handle and a link to this post in our handout if you want to see the original graphic that she created along with her other works. <clears throat> she says, quote, while self-care is an act of individual compassion that we all need and deserve, community care unites us all. So I thought this was fitting to some of the ideas we wanted to express today. In our work, we have attempted to contribute to well-being of our community by creating and fostering an environment where equity, diversity, accessibility, and inclusion are an integral part of the work that we do. So in our next section, we'll each be taking talking about some of the internal library connections that we have made. A July, July 2019 article by Francisca Alesso Bendish from Forbes.com titled Companies Should Include Community Building in Wellness Programs states, quote, when communities exist in the workplace, employees feel a sense of belonging and connectedness at work. 
employees value networking within common interest groups and companies that are supporting community building at work say they're seeing employees bring their whole self to work with increased productivity and commitment to the company. So each of us has worked to foster a sense of community through our work, which includes both some formal channels such as working groups, communities of practice, but also informal channels such as side conversations and coffee chats that are equally as important. So one example that I'm going to share today is an internal library group, a community of practice. Uh, this was created with objectives that include awareness raising on equity, diversity, inclusion, accessibility, and anti-racism topics, resource sharing, providing a safe, brave space for learning and asking questions, and creating a sense of belonging and inclusion. So the name, so Inclu-O, inclusion, and then O for University of Ottawa, was started by Cecilia as a the name for a Slack channel before I started at the library. So it's a place for library staff to share things like articles, webinars, information related to EDI. This later moved to an MS Teams channel once we got that set up at the library. And then once I started in 2019, um, shortly after, Cecilia and I started the community of practice with the same name. So while we've had, um, we still have the general Incluo channel as well. The community of practice was meant to meet regularly, discuss and learn content together on topics that include accessibility, anti-racism, anti-oppression, indigenous topics, and work on projects together. <clears throat> the goal is to have a place that staff can learn, but also feel like they're included and heard. We have done a mix of presentations by staff members, sharing personal knowledge and experience to sessions where we discuss certain topics as a group, listen to something together and discuss as well. <clears throat> Through the discussions we've had and the work we're doing, we're getting more people from all different areas from the library that, are, that have approached us for help or to work with us on different initiatives. <clears throat> there are many library staff who truly want to improve and make the organization a more inclusive place. We've also changed from a model of initially just Cecily and I as co-chairs to bringing in a few people from the group as well as a steering committee to help plan content, FATU included. The hope is that bringing in additional members will help us not only in creating content for the meetings, but add diverse perspectives and voices to the discussions and content. In working towards a more inclusive workplace through this community of practice, we hope that this contributes to the well-being of all library staff. <clears throat> Another group that has been around for many years at the library is the Library Training Committee. So through the Library Training Committee, um, the goal is to support library employees, maintain and improve their skills and knowledge, and be part of a larger framework for professional development. So we have activities for staff throughout the year, and we have what's called Staff Month every year in May, which is a mix of social and professional development or learning activities. So it used to actually just be one week in May, it was Staff Week, but the pandemic and the move to virtual activities in 2020 made us rethink the format. and the month-long format was more popular so we decided to stick with that. So I'm in my second year of being chair for this committee and we focused more in the last few years on learning opportunities related to EDI, so improving knowledge and skills related to accessibility, issues around LGBTQ plus communities, Indigenous topics, anti-racism for example. As I joined this committee and later the chair role during the pandemic we've also tried to focus on activities related to both EDI and wellness. The uh, University of Ottawa Library signed up as an employer partner with CCDI or the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion. So for staff month we also promoted many of their webinars and we promote it throughout the year as well. U Ottawa is also a partner with Pride at Work Canada so during our staff month and throughout the year we pr promote their webinars as well. Early in the pandemic, while everyone was working remotely, we also organized a virtual concert for all library staff by a local contemporary folk singing duo called Moonfruits, if you want to look them up, which we hoped would pr improve morale of the staff during a difficult period when people were very isolated. So Canadian Library Month um, happens in October, so in 2020, um, for Canadian Library Workers Day in October also, we our committee put together care packages for a small group of staff that were working in person, while many of us worked at home for the most part. So <clears throat> in the picture here, you see some of the items from the care package, which included tea, chapstick, some treats, and the message, thank you for being here. We also organized many fun virtual activities throughout the pandemic period, including things like trivia, bingo, to try and bring people together, even if we were working apart. Pass it over to Cecilia. Thanks, Megan. So 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I've attempted to lead from a place of care. So at the start of the pandemic, many of us at the library recognize a need to have ways to communicate about fun things. So topics outside of work to help build community and ties across the library. So I worked um, really closely with the communications advisor and the marketing officer and created a few channels on Teams. Some had originally already existed on Slack before we moved on to Teams. So we had topics, um, channels like Biblio Kids, Pause Cafe, Pause being P-A-W-S, you can guess what that was about. Um, Black, which is our Friday lunch adventure club. Um, and so since then, we've, some other channels have been created to fulfill the interests of staff. For, for example, we have one called and Zivalti Fund. So of course we have to try and make bilingual names. We're at the University of Ottawa. Um, and there's a recent one on, on fashion that we just sort of started as well. So we created these channels to share thoughts and recommendations about activities or things that are just keeping us entertained. Um, so now I didn't have to do this at all. This is not part of my job, but because I'm a manager and I really do care about creating a sense of community in the workplace and to be honest, we spend many, many, many hours of our days, obviously at work. Um, I really just wanted to create a workplace that I wanted to work in. So the SSDS, yes, completely selfish reasons why I created some of these channels. But I really do think people actually did benefit from these channels. Um, I take my position as a manager and a library leader quite seriously. Um, so I did learn, did some learning on my own. And so I could, so I would be able to better lead and talk about what wellness means and what caring actually means in a workplace. Essentially, I wanted to be the manager that I wish I had had over the years. Now, don't get me wrong. It's, I'm not saying that I didn't have any wonderful supervisors or mentors throughout the years, um, but leading and managing during times of crises um, is a totally different ballgame. So I read about and attended webinars or lectures on various topics like trauma-informed librarianship. What is trauma-informed stewardship? What does that look like? Um, I've learned a lot from Nisha Modi, who's a feminist healing coach, writer, and a librarian who centers the needs of BIPOC folks. Um, and these are some sort of linked in our handout as well that we'll share at the end. Um, I read, so the, the book that you see noted here, The Care Manifesto, The Politics of Interdependence. Um, I really love the work of the Othering and Belonging Institute that's based at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, and I'm a big Brene Brown fan. I know there's some haters of Brene Brown, but I really enjoy her work. And a lot of her, um, her podcasts are, have been really, um, really useful for me as a, as a leader, as a library leader. So within the workplace, I continuously had to remind myself that I was replaceable. Um, and I've also actually told my team the same thing. And this is we're all replaceable, which was, you know, may have sounded shocking to them at the time. And I was probably at this moment at the, in the pandemic where I was like, please stop burning yourself out. We are all replaceable. Um, but it was a reminder that their job was not worth sacrificing their health and well being. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Fatu now to hear her perspectives on building internal communications. So I found that formal groups such as the um, Incluo community and the library training community that Megan spoke of have been fantastic outlets for building connections with the internal library community. But for me, the most meaningful connections I made came from informal channels, um, such as side conversations and teams during or after meetings or through the Teams channels that Cecilia um, just spoke about. Um, and I found that Microsoft Teams has been a fantastic tool during the pandemic, not only to stay connected, um, but also to get to know your colleagues in a way that you necessarily wouldn't if you were back at the office. Um, having these Teams channels dedicated to different topics um, enable us to find colleagues with similar, similar interests and hobbies that are across all departments of the library that normally you might not meet just because your work does not intersect. So I find that we were able to create, I mean, Cecilia was able to create this digital water cooler talk um, and create this platform where we can engage and talk about things that are not always work related. Um, but the other great thing about Teams is that you're also able to engage with people at all levels of management in a very informal way, which really humanizes managers and opens up new channels of communication between managers um, and employees. So these informal connections I find are very valuable for one's occupational wellness because not only do they allow you to disconnect from your work for a few moments, but they also contribute to building a sense of community and I find brings joy to the workplace. Um, and now that we're slowly going back to the office, uh, Teams is still playing an important role in connecting with our internal community, but 
um, it took an additional role of being a space where I, we can plan for in-person activities. So for example, our uh, Friday lunch adventure club channel where people were asking for restaurant recommendations or posting new things that they've tried. Um, now this channel can be a place where we can plan to go to places over lunch. Um, so as we slowly go back to being in person full time, I think that teams will continue to serve as a very valuable place for informal connections and building relationships and also potential work collaborations. So on top of building connections with our internal library community, it was also very important to build connections with our external community, such as students, staff and faculty. So we will be sharing examples of how we try to contribute to the well-being um, of our external community while uh, balancing our own well-being at the same time. Thanks, Vishu, and thanks for all the, the love in the chat. I'm really kind of excited to see this. And I always want to be in the chat, but I know that I present anyways. People know that I love the chat. So thank you for adding that in. So one recent example that we just um, finished doing was our Asian Heritage Month event at our team or my team organized, which was called Celebrating Asian Joy, a conversation with TU Ottawa professors. So while being while physical well-being was in the initial objective of this particular event, obviously we, we realized that after the event, for me in particular, I felt like the, the whole experience was a true bomb for the soul for many, um, particularly those who identified as Asian. But this wasn't actually exclusively the, the case. Many of those who attended shared with me afterwards that the event really resonated with them as the two authors discussed many themes common to, across all humanity. So inclusion, belonging, language, love, conflict, hope, despair. So our first in-person and virtual event since March 2020 was a resounding success in my eyes in any ways. Um, not so much because of the spring rolls and the samosas, so they were tasty. Uh, but because we were able to really intentionally create a meaningful space in person and online with the Zoom space being moderated by our wonderful colleague, Valentina Lee, some of you may know her. Um, so participants shared so many experiences that were really poignant and touching in the chat. Um, it was, again, a place where I wanted to be in, but I can't be in two places at once. It was really difficult. So here are just two short excerpts that you see on the screen. One from Professor Kimberly Kyoge Andrews, who says, thank you from the bottom of my heart for organizing this event with such generosity and spirit. Um, she also added that um, for her, it had been a really weird first year to be at the University of Ottawa um, and that she hadn't gotten a chance to figure out what community might look like. So that um, in her eyes, she was really, she was really grateful for the support and the care that we showed um, in this event. Um, and Professor Jamie Liu, the other author who was in this um, sort of featured in the event, uh, noted that from the little Asian decor, snacks and the comfy chairs, not to mention the engagement on the chat and the wonderful introduction, you all made this event amazing. So it really meant so much to me and my team that we were able, that we recognized in particular for our care, not just the samosas and spring rolls, but for our care. Um, so I'm just going to pass it along now to Megan to continue talking about some of our outreach activities. So I'm going to be talking about uh, and sharing one recent example of how we've attempted to contribute to the well-being of our community by connecting with our student community through relationship building. So we've done many online posts, including social media posts over the past few years focusing on connecting with the community through our intention to show our commitment to EDI. So on the screen are some photos of the library book display up last week to highlight National Accessibility Week. Um, for this display, so in the center top, um, we have the, the books that were on display. And then on the right um, side where it says featured books, we had posted some of the titles in the display to our social media channels as well. So for this display, it was, the, it was the first one we did in collaboration with a student group on campus, which was the Center for Students with Disabilities. So we worked with them to choose the titles, some of which were purchased spe specifically for the display. And I've also gotten to know two of the students in particular from the center, particularly the coordinator as we've um, worked together over the past um, year on different things. And we've had many discussions, shared thoughts and experiences over issues related to accessibility and disability justice. And I also asked the coordinator of the center if they would design a button because we bought a button maker last year for our team. So the coordinator for the center designed 
um, the button shown in the bottom center photo. So the text reads, and it's in English and French, in various fonts that are intentionally difficult to read. And it says ableism isn't always this obvious. So we also created a web page with a post um, with the book titles and text about National Accessibility Week, as well as information about the Center for Students with Disabilities. So both students who worked on this with us were very happy and excited with the result of this. Um, so hope, we're hoping that we can work with them on future initiatives as well. Other ways this EDI initiative contributes to well-being is through the connection to students, so working with the Center for Students with Disabilities. <clears throat> this has opened up the conversation about collaborating in future initiatives. And after my meeting with one of the students from the Center, we started talking about spaces and they also have a low stimulus room at their Center. And we talked about ideas possibly in the future of doing something similar at the library. I also think that in building our library collection, not just for research needs, but for reading and learning independ independently on these topics that so we're contributing to the inclusion and well-being of our community by showing our commitment to this work. So I will pass the next example over to Fatou. Um, so for me, connecting to the external library community looks quite different just due to the nature of my role. Um, where I only interact with researchers when they have a data curation need. I don't really interact with students. Um, so when I first started in this role, I spent some time developing my service offerings and trying to figure out where my boundaries would be when it came to supporting researchers. Um, I wanted to make sure that I didn't say yes to everything and didn't go above and beyond for each request as it can get overwhelming and be really fast. Um, I am the only person manning the service which means that I handle all requests and the capacity to go the extra mile is quite limited. Um, so the approach that I decided to take was that um, I would prioritize and do the extra work when it comes to projects with an EDI focus and also incorporating EDI principles into my work. So more specifically, when I make presentations to researchers about um, research data management and the data curation service that I offer. So, I make it a point to spend some time talking about the care principles of Indigenous data governance, as well as the principles of ownership, control, access, and possession, or OCAP for Indigenous data. And I do this not only to educate researchers who work with Indigenous data and may not be aware of these principles, but also as a way to connect with researchers who are, who are already doing this work and implementing these principles. Um, and seeing how we can engage and um, collaborate together and do something that will benefit both, both of our work. Um, so for me, managing a data repository, I have been thinking a lot about the type of data that comes in and um, ensuring that this data is not used to further marginalize certain communities such as indigenous communities. So collaborating with researchers that have this expertise and knowledge really enables uh, me to learn uh, from them and their knowledge and ensure that my service is rooted in principles of equity um, and does not reinforce colonial concepts, concepts of um, data governance. So while doing this work though, we um, it wasn't all rosy and peaches. We all have encountered some challenges um, while trying to promote the wellness of our internal and external communities as well as maintaining our own wellness. So in the next section, we're just going to be talking about um, some of the challenges that we experience from a middle margin perspective or challenges from a first time inclusion librarian and for me as a neurodiverse person. Thanks for two. So yeah, we're going to get into some of the, the challenges that we faced in doing this work. And so I've added on the slide um, a tweet from Anne Helen Peterson. Some of you may have attended the Conference on Academic Library Management, which was in April, um, had a chance to, per to participate in that conference and to hear from Anne Helen Peterson herself, who had this really fantastic keynote that quite literally made me cry and made a lot of people <laughs> cry. Um, it was just so um, touching and really just like cut through to some of the, like, the huge challenges that we've been experiencing during the pandemic. And so I'll, I've just picked out this one quote where she says, it is incredibly difficult to get anything done, let alone innovate and rethink the way you do things or a better manager or try and break down the white supremacy or settler thinking under, undergirding the institution when precarity and scarcity are this ubiquitous. So 
as I complete my 18th year as a full-time academic librarian, which is still kind of shocking to me to think that it's been that long, I've had a lot of time to reflect on my career during the past two years, where perhaps like many of you, you've asked questions like, why am I in this profession? Why am I in this institution still? And of course, the age old question of what is time? Um, so as a manager for over 10 years of that time and someone who has built up some expertise in leading small teams, I can honestly say that it's been the hardest two years of my professional career. Why? First off, I'm, a, I'm an empath and so I've dealt with a lot of my own big, big emotions along with those of my team members and colleagues. Secondly, I'm currently one of only two women of color managers on the management team. And so from a North American perspective, our profession remains predominantly white. This is not new. Um, the Vimlock, Visible Minority of Librarians of Canada 2021 Redux survey of the 160 minority librarians who responded from across different library settings. So this is not just academic libraries. Only 21 of them indicated that they were in a middle management role. So it has not always been easy to build community with other Canadian academic librarians in management roles. The third reason why it's been tough, um, I happen to be co-leading many of the many, sorry, many of the EDI initiatives in the library, and it is sometimes difficult to bring my whole self to work uh, because it doesn't always feel safe to do so. So the amount of emotional labor and care work that I've been doing has been has been a lot. Um, it's been a challenge to keep filling my cup to do this work. Although I have amazing allies and colleagues, two of whom are of course here, and some of them are in the chat, um, who are supportive and wonderful. Uh, I know I'm not in this alone. Um, as and Megan actually pointed out, this quote to me from, um, from Levi Ajayi Jones, who says, we've got to pour into ourselves so that we can pour into others without our wells going dry. So remaining mentally well in order to support the wellness of my team and to push through EDI efforts has been challenging and only recently more manageable as I've learned to set boundaries. Fatou has just talked about boundaries in her own service, um, which is, I think it's so fantastic. Um, it's still not great in this, you know, yes profession that we tend to, to continue to be in. Um, I've leaned on our other managers and colleagues outside of the University of Ottawa. Uh, I've made some lifetime friends um, through Vimlock, the ARL Leadership and Career Development Program, which I was really fortunate to finish uh, last year, um, and through the We Here Network. So I've found my people, I guess I could say. I've leaned on them a lot, and I would say to don't. I know I was learning to, to ask for help when I need to. So on another note, earlier this year, I found out that the University of Ottawa was listed as a top employer. So some of you may know this um, publication or a website also called Canada's Top 100 Employers. So why are we a top employer? So apparently we have created the You Matter, We Care initiative to help managers support employees over the course of the pandemic. So We've, they organize wellness surveys, virtual town halls, a virtual wellness series, additional days off of their past years. Those days off are great. Uh, and these are probably similar at, at your institutions, the whole idea of like, you know, wellness series, et cetera. But what I kind of continue to puzzle over is who is caring for the managers. It's often fairly isolating work. Um, and we eventually did learn, and I you know, pers personally learned how to lean on other managers. Um, and how to build community with them, but that wasn't always easy. And so again, um, we, we've relied on channel, you know, back channel, you know, discussions on teams, um, also known as the meetings after the meetings. Um, could I have used some more support from my institution and from li library leadership in general? 100% yes. Am I still struggling to ask for what I need? Yes. Am I going on a leave for three months to fully decompress and heal my mind, body, and spirit? Also, yes, which I'm quite privileged to be doing. So I'm going to leave it at that with my own challenges. Uh, and Megan's going to going to talk from her perspective. Thanks, Cecilia. So I've also faced challenges in the last two and a half years since I started in this role both personal and professional, as I've attempted to navigate the pressures of an inaugural role. So the first inclusion librarian at UOttawa, which I started in late 2019, while also dealing with family obligations, having two small kids at home, physical and mental health challenges, all during a global pandemic. I started as the first inclusion librarian at UOttawa just six months before the world shut down in March 2020. 
after spending nearly my entire librarian career in a public library in accessibility services, so about eight years before making the switch to academic. While my background and both personal and professional ex experience related more to issues of disability and accessibility, I've learned a lot in the past few years about other areas of inclusion work. The work that I do and that we do at the library is challenging, it's rewarding, I think we've made some great progress at our library, but this kind of work can also be slow and it's ongoing. We have also met with some resistance in some areas, which can be frustrating and challenging and has made us kind of rethink, refocus how we want to do certain things. It can be frustrating when things can seem you know, so clear and obvious to us, but takes work to convince others of its value and need. I think this work cannot be rushed. It's you know, built in many ways on community connections and relationship building that doesn't work if the interactions are transactional. They have to be built over time, be purposeful and value and respect people and the principles of equity, equity, diversity, inclusion and accessibility. I've also realized that this kind of work impacts my own well-being and at times can also be exhausting. So to continue to do this work and learn continuously about these topics means having to set aside sometimes time to decompress and also do a lot of thinking. Have I completed all the objectives and goals I set out for myself in this role so far? No, but um, as so this is a quote taken from the same article that Cecilia mentioned in the last slide by Anne Helen Peterson, sometimes less is more and sometimes more is actually less. So you can try to create a match between the amount of work there is and the capacity of your team to do the work well. So I think in our team and our work at the library in this area, we've attempted as much as possible to focus on doing intentional work. So while, while realizing the limits and capacities of all of us and our well-being, we sometimes have big plans for what we want to get done, but the energy and time don't always match up, especially over the past few years. But I think that's okay, and I'd rather wait and spend the time later and do something intentional and meaningful. So I'll pass it over to Fatou to share her experiences. So um, I identify as being neurodiverse, and sometimes when I'm extremely interested in a topic, um, I tend to hyper-focus and put all my time and energy in it. Um, so meaning I will work on this thing for five hours straight, not eating what is food. I don't know what it is. It's just your brain is fully focused on this one thing and nothing else exists. So this is kind of the case when it comes to doing equity work because it is something that I'm passionate about. Therefore, I will hyper focus on it. And this can become a problem when you're doing equity work as part of your tasks at work, then the line between passion and work becomes kind of blurry and it becomes a lot harder to establish boundaries and maintain a healthy work-life balance. Um, doing this work also, and also being affected by issues of EDI also adds to it. So I really need to rein myself in and establish firm boundaries in order, in order not to burn out. Um, and this problem is common neurodiverse or not. Like Megan said, sometimes you just have to set time apart and reflect on it. And it is hard to establish boundaries when it's something that you're passionate about um, and you're trying to contribute to the wellness of others. But you also do need to take a step back and think about your own wellness and if this is actually being positively impacting your wellness or negatively impacting your wellness. Um, and I wish I had some advice or thoughts about how I managed to break out of hyperfocus and establish these boundaries. But the truth is, I don't. Um, I still hyperfocus. I hyperfocused on this presentation. Um, but I think that mm, being aware of it, of what you're taking on, and understanding that maybe you need to make adjustments um, is the first step. And I think I'm just going to end it with a quote from this uh, Forbes article, and it was written by an occupational psychologist, Nancy Doyle. Um, and she was talking about um, setting boundaries when you're neurodiverse. And it says, assuming responsibility to help others is surely a good thing, but making the work sustainable was important, especially when factoring an autistic ADHD tendency to burn out from hyperfocus. So as uh, someone who's autistic and had his ADHD, um, I do assume a lot of the responsibility to help others and contribute to the wellness, but I do need to understand uh, when it's time to step back and ensure that the work is sustainable. Thanks, Vishu. Thanks for that sharing. So I'm going to conclude with a few, um, few thoughts. So 
This is from Priya Parker, who identifies as biracial. She's a conflict resolution strategist and the author of the acclaimed book, The Art of Gathering, which is um, actually a book that Megan had introduced to me probably over a year ago. And I've um, since become quite uh, enamored with, with her work. Um, so she re recently shared this on Instagram. She says, when we interact, we change one another. So she goes on to say that, when I talk about gatherings having the potential to be transformative, I don't mean fireworks and world changing in the way so often we think. I'm talking about the deep privilege of being altered, hopefully for the better, by how we spent our time together. What we learned, what we heard, what we did, that perhaps left us slightly different than when we first arrived. So this really resonated with us specifically because we are each uh, working on EDI initiatives separately, but more importantly, together. And even when we do work separately on things, we are very often bringing back experiences and thoughts into a shared space, whether this is in meetings, now in in-person chats over coffee, and more likely in a Teams channel. So these are small incremental moments of interaction that slowly build up and lead to trust, camaraderie, connection. And as Megan mentioned earlier, we are seeing a slight shift in our work culture as well with uh, folks coming to us and asking how we can support them in, in making their work a little more inclusive. So imagine then the ripple effect as students and faculty benefit from receiving services and programming from these individuals who are coming and seeking to us for, for, for support in, doing, in making their work more inclusive. So our last, um, so to wrap up, um, we'd like to leave you with another quote, this time from Karen Walrond, um, who's the author of The Lightmaker's Manifesto, who was in conversation with Brene Brown on her podcast, Unlocking Us. Like I said, Brene Brown fan. Um, she says, I will never apologize for embracing the joy and beauty, even when the world is falling apart, because joy and beauty are my fuel for activism. So for those of us who are doing work at the intersection of EDI and wellness, who are doing activist work in the library and for all the allies and co-conspirators to this work, this is an important message, particularly with the really heavy news cycle that we've been sort of experiencing um, and hearing about in the past few weeks, months, years, really. We too often feel like we are working in darkness and that we are experiencing crisis after crisis and that the calls to do better will never cease. So we encourage you to continue to find joy, however small, yes, and even if that is a beautiful, colorful, floral scented bath ball. So thank you very much for your attendance today, for your engagement in the chat. Um, we really welcome your questions and your reflections and your feedback at this time. And there is a, a link to our um, a handout in the slide as well. So it's bit.ly slash beyond bath bombs and our contact um, information is also located here. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia, Megan, and Fatou. Oh, it was so it was a great presentation. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please pop them into the Q&A. Um, I mean, I know it takes a little bit of time to type. So I'll just kind of throw out a question. I've been kind of mulling over a bit uh, on my own, um, just having to do with like Slack, using Slack and using like Microsoft Teams at work. One of the things that really has kind of, um, I guess I had a chat, like I love Slack to no end. I could use it, everyone, let's just use Slack all the time. But I found that quite a bit of, um, I've had a conversation with someone who's just like very uncomfortable with it because she's like, well, I'm worried that my workplace is now taking note of what conversations I'm having with people. And it kind of also creates this, I guess, um, need to constantly respond right away, as opposed to an email, you could take a little bit of time, you know, as Otherwise, on Slack, they see that you're online. Why aren't you talking? So, what are what do you guys think? <laughs> I think that's a good point. Um, I I also love Slack, and I kind of wish we had continued on Slack. But of course, we've we've got teams right now. Um, what are my thoughts on that? I I feel like if I guess I'm, I'm speaking for as a manager, I guess I have certain, you know, communication guidelines. And I think I, I let my team know that, you know, if I put a message on, on teams, 
I will say like if, if it's not urgent, like I will like literally say it, it is not urgent. Like it's it's more just like an FYI sort of thing. Um, and I liked and I prefer to use email for like you know actual things that need to be kind of kept in a, in an official manner. If there are people who are uncomfortable using it, I I kind of get that, and I don't know if there's a good answer around like how to have like, again maybe the, the the idea of like boundaries and and, and guardrails is, is is important for that for our workplaces um, to sort of settle on. Um, those are just like my random thoughts for now. I also enjoy the random channel on Slack. That's like my favorite channel because I always have random thoughts. Does anyone else have? Uh, CP2 is unmuted. Yeah, um, I was just gonna say I I have had um, that problem where you know sometimes people will be a little bit more pushy on um, teams or expect an answer right away and at first um, I kind of had a little freak out and was getting overwhelmed and would just not answer them but I think now I developed the habit to just tell the person hey I've seen your message I will get back to you um, when I can um, yeah I think it's kind of a better approach than to just ignore them but it is Kind of hard to balance uh, people's expectations of always wanting to have instant access to you. Thank you. So we do have a question from someone else. So uh, Kajula is asking, curious how you work to welcome new employees into your community. I don't love the term onboarding, but do you have a cohesive approach for when people are joining your team? I could start because um, I'm as a manager and I'm part of the, the management group at our library. There's about a dozen of us. And so we've worked to actually create a, a template um, listing like just so as, as a means of being consistent when we when we do try to onboard. Yes, OK, no, not a great word um, when we do try to onboard anyone new at the, at the library, whether they're a librarian or um, part of the administrative staff. And so we, we try to hit all like the key areas um, so that we there is consistency. But I've really liked adding things like where can you get coffee? Where can I like where can I go get a noodle soup? So things that are a little more personal and not just like, you know, where do I get my employee card? Um, so I think each manager like tries to add and customize that template a little bit, but it's sort of core as to what we're covering when we when we sort of welcome a new person. Um, I also just like, we've actually hired a lot during the pandemic. We still have, we have not stopped hiring. Um, so I, I I do the, you know, make take a personal time like to like literally just email that for, new person who has started and just I can just say send a little hello just so that they know that somebody has seen that they've come uh, and I think a lot of other people do that as well which is lovely um oh thanks for you <laughs> I do try like because I can I just have have been imagining these people who are starting and not seeing anyone and thinking that that was like the worst time to ever join and many of you may maybe have done the same and so again I feel like that that empath in me is just can't not say hi so <laughs> that's what I do I, I was just going to add, I think some of the Teams channels, the kind of fun team channels add to that too, because again, I mean, I started just before the pandemic, so I got to know people in person, but you know, now when we see, you know, a name of a new hire, like you don't, if you don't interact with, with that role, you might not see them, but Teams does a good job and sort of, you know, you can talk about food or you can talk about, uh, Cecilia, just me, I think the newest channel now is about fashion. So, you know, you can chat with your colleagues about kind of fun topics and get to know them outside of work, even in a virtual setting. So I think that's one, one area that's been good for that. Great. Um, I guess, is there any other questions that anyone has? I mean, there's been a lot of thank yous. Uh, I can just say like, I think everyone shares similar opinions to me. It's very, uh, <laughs> it's very enlightening and nice to see uh, different perspectives uh, from each of you on how you kind of have gone through with it. Uh, just trying to think if I if I can raise any other questions that I've, uh, I definitely have a lot of uh, new readings that I want to do. <laughs> Asterix to no noted for myself, so much appreciated on that too. Oh, I was also, this is a very much, uh, I guess, a question on, so we deal a lot with like, you know, we're talking obviously about wellness and in that wellness um, circle at the beginning, one thing that kind of stuck out to me that I found was a little bit, uh, I guess it just kind of popped in my head of like the lack of, I guess, the socioeconomic issues that exist and like how 
yeah, great. You can eat, you can eat super healthy, but how are you eating super healthy when like costs are skyrocketing, right? Like the cheapest thing to buy now is like pasta and like, you know, and eat that with maybe some like cheese. So it kind of, hmm. Sorry, I'm still still mulling over a question, <laughs> but it's one of those kind of key. Is there a way to add something along those lines within this within um, within that cycle itself within the circle? Sorry. I think that in a way, this like financial wellness kind of ties into like your occupational wellness. So your wellness at work, um, because I'm, I mean, I guess that's how you're making your income and eating. Um, but I, it comes to the responsibility, I guess, of workplaces or um, kind of the system to ensure that your employees are taken care of financially. Um, how can they do that? Not sure. I know that within kind of private companies, tech companies, it's a lot easier. They have bigger budgets um, to do more things, but within an academic library, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, and I'm not sure if I have an answer to that, but yeah, that's what I can add. Thank you. Yeah, I know that, I know I'm asking the kind of like difficult, we none of us really have, <laughs> have really like a solution, but uh, oh, I see Ali's uh, adding a little bit too. That uh, yeah, some wheels include financial wellness. Yeah, that's a well, that's so good to know too. Yeah, <laughs> of adding that kind of component in also. Um, is there, I guess, any other questions from anyone else that wants to um, propose anything or? Have any like mulled things they've been mulling over? Um, otherwise, I wonder if we should just, uh, if we only have, what is it, four more minutes left? We could just wrap it up. And <laughs> for myself, I'll be getting a little bit of an early lunch. <laughs> um, so I, I think, yeah, I think we're good to go. So thank you again um, to the three of you. It's been 